Welcome back to the IG Group Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Franklin. Today we have on a very, very interesting guest. He's going to go through some things that have happened in the LBL. For those who are unaware, that is the land between the lakes, which is in northwestern um, Tennessee and uh, southwestern Kentucky. So it's between uh, both of the borders there. And it's a very interesting supernatural area. Uh, I've spoken to Daryl Den- Denton about this on many occasions. And um, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and get into it. So without further ado, welcome to the I Jupiter podcast, Mr. Steve Causey. Good to be here. Great having you on, man. So um, sure, yeah, you're welcome, I guess. Sure. We had, a, we had to like bump this back one week because of something popped up on your half. I took off a, a work an hour early to make sure I can get here because of the time shift. Uh, daylight saving time just happened, but in Mexico, it doesn't move. So now I have to consider myself mountain time. So it's been a, a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, for the people out there who are not aware of who you are, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and promote anything you'd like? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm. Uh, my name is Steve Causey. I'm a retired engineer. I've written a book called The LBL Massacre, which is based on a story that uh, I heard uh, many years ago, back in 1998. Uh, and this story entails the alleged massacre that occurred in the land between the lakes of a, a family of four uh, that was uh, literally mutilated uh, in the land between the lakes. Uh, now, uh, there are people who dispute the where, the when, and, and what have you. But I heard the story directly from someone that I think actually probably might have inside information on this. At the time, to be honest with you, I was very skeptical of the story. I didn't really think much of it. I was on a fishing trip, uh, but it definitely garnered my interest. It was so uh, so much of a story that uh, it, it garnered my interest, and I had an interest in it from that day on. Uh, recent witnesses coming out of this area. One of them is uh, named Martin Groves, uh, who has done a lot of podcasts. He's uh, probably one of the more famous people uh, who is a retired law enforcement officer who had an experience with uh, these creatures, which are called dogmen in the land between the lakes. It is suspected that the, uh, or almost certain that the creature that did this damage uh, to this family and literally slaughtered them uh, was a dog man. As a matter of fact, in my uh, book, based on the story I had heard, uh, I'll give you uh, a little bit more information about how they discovered this creature and literally how the military came in and took it out on the back of a deuce and a half truck. So this is not well known, uh, and some people dispute that fact, but uh, this was a story I was told. And keep in mind, this is a over a 40-year-old uh, code case. And some of the 
some people claim to, you know, have different versions of this. I'm just relating the version I heard. Uh, a couple of things came to my attention that made me think that in recent years that this story was true. One of them was that I actually ran a bait shop at the entrance of the land between the lakes back in 1982. Uh, I sold minnows, I sold a uh, little bit of everything, I sold, uh, uh, you know, anything you'd need to go fishing. So uh, I, I was right at a pre uh, pre premium place right at the entrance to the south which is in a small town called Dover, Tennessee. And uh, I had a couple of fishermen come back from the land between the lakes uh, one morning, and uh, uh, they asked me, do you know why the land between the lakes is closed? They had closed off all entrances to the land between the lakes. And at that time, I, I had no, no clue why they had closed it off. I said, I don't know. But there was more than one fisherman that came back and alerted me to the fact that it was closed. And I said, well, that's very unusual. And it was indeed unusual back in the 80s to close down uh, this park because uh, it was a very good revenue stream uh, for the government and uh, at that time controlled by the TVA. So that's one fact that I do remember and have a personal experience with that the park did indeed close. And I, since this was 40 years ago, uh, I pride myself on my long-term memory, but my long-term memory does have its limitations. I know this was in the month of April. Uh, I believe it was the 6th or 7th of April in 1982. However, not knowing what this might entail or what this might involve, I did not take the calendar and mark, uh, take a marker and mark on it because well, they closed it. Uh, maybe something happened in there. I didn't know. But it was extremely unusual for them to close it. I, 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 up to that point, I'd never known them close the park. Uh, the other detail that came out, the story I heard was that there were six coroners that came to the scene because they were having trouble identifying the marks on the bodies that were left in this camper. The father's found uh, outside of the camper, a uh, little bit in front of the camper, and his arms had literally been ripped off and thrown to one to each side. Uh, the power that's required to do that is, I, I can't even tell you. It looked like right. they had been, he had severe <clears throat> bites on him. Uh, he had scratch marks down his back, which would be a, a key determining factor in, in what creature did this. Uh, the, the little boy, which was approximately uh, 14 years old, uh, give or take, may have been 13, was found just outside the camper, and uh, he was trying to make his way back into the camper. The mother was found inside the camper. The uh, camper itself had the door was hanging by one hinge. It had been literally oh built, uh, which takes a good fair amount of... Uh, forced to, to rip a camper door off, you know, when it's secured. Mm -hmm. uh, she was severely mutilated. Uh, and the story I heard was that uh, these coroners were going over the scene trying to figure out what had caused this. And uh, one of these coroners that I heard in my story was from Memphis, Tennessee. That fact is another fact that I'll bring up that kind of qualifies the story I heard as being true. I had a retired law enforcement officer tell me, uh, and this occurred near a small town called Grand Rivers, Kentucky, uh, just inside the LBL a few miles, told me that uh, if they were going to call in a regional coroner to uh, somebody that would be uh, a regional coroner to assist small town coroners to identify death scenes. Uh, the person that would cover this territory in uh, South Con Central Kentucky, uh, basically just on the other side of the land between the lakes, would be from Memphis, Tennessee. So I found that very interesting. And uh, the retired law enforcement officer that I knew would obviously know where they would call a regional uh, corner right. in from. Because and Memphis is I mean, like, covers, I'm sorry. Memphis Memphis is like what three to four hours away, isn't it? 
Yes, uh, it's about uh, by by car. You can make it uh, to uh, the land between the lakes area in about two hours and forty five minutes. Okay. So uh, you know it's not an extreme distance away, but it's but, you know but it's, it's unusual. Yeah, yeah yes. unusual. And what's unusual is to have six corners on the on the scene of something like this to begin with. Yes. Uh, but he did qualify the fact that uh, if you were going to call in a regional corner to South Central Kentucky or West Tennessee in this area, that this corner would be from Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, what they finally came to the conclusion was, and mainly uh, they found some fur in the hands of this uh, father, uh, his dismembered arm, which was a black oh. fur. And uh, they also saw marks on the back of the father, which included five digits. Uh, four of them were deeper penetrations and the... Uh, <laughs> Excuse me, got a little phlegm in my throat. It's pollen this time of year. The uh, fifth one was an opposing thumb. Now, what creatures have four fingers and opposing thumbs? Uh, uh, it ain't a bear. Not a bear, eight, that's for sure. Not bear. Bears have a round track. Uh, right. And these were deep penetrations. In addition, they found bite wounds on the... Uh, uh, father, the son, and the mother, apparently, from the story I had heard, had put up the most fight, and she was literally mutilated. They found the same hand marks on the inside of the uh, trailer with blood on them, where wow. it had scraped down the trailer, uh, or the inside of the camper. Can so you, can this you, was quite, quite a grisly scene. Steve, can you, go and, can you go and find this on any kind of county coroner records, or... What is, uh, what is the, how much red tape do you have to go through to get any of this kind of information? The answer to that question is no. And in my book, it will tell you this cover, this story supposedly and allegedly, uh, I don't know it occurred for a fact, but I, I find the evidence overwhelming with, with the people I've talked to okay. indicate that this story was covered up uh, because it would affect visitations to the land between the lakes, which was a, a, a pretty broad area. But the campsite that was where this was, uh, this occurred uh, or supposedly occurred is, uh, has a small graveyard beside it. And uh, the camp yard, uh, the campsite is no longer there. They didn't just close the campsite. They came in and leveled it, removed everything. Wow. So and there's records no of the either. there's records of the campsite existing though. Uh, yes, there was okay. known that there was a campsite there, and I have pictures in my book that'll show the bases to bathrooms, the foundations to bathrooms. There were cisterns in there. There were several different structures in this area. Wow. You can see, and I've been to the site myself. You can actually see where there was circular pavement. As a matter of fact, there's a wide piece of pavement that was left there that's about six inches long by about uh, six feet wide that just a piece of a paved road that was literally dosed up that was left on site there. So there were paved roads in this area. There were campsites. It was, it was known to be a camping area. Uh, and the site was literally erased. It was not just closed. I mean, it brings the question, why would you not just close the campsite for whatever reason, if it was, uh, you know, if it wasn't doing well, which uh, it was, obviously, uh, or rather just tear it down with a bulldozer, uh, which something, is obviously what happened. Which means something, to, I mean, for the government or whatever agency did that, there must have been some extremely some extenuating circumstances in which they'd have to do that or want to do that and um the fact that they're covering it up just i mean i'm sure you have other instances of it probably gives the this this whole story some some type of like foundation of truth you know what i'm saying so, i believe I mean, so in, in my opinion it does uh and i think i'd actually ask the fact of the gentleman that was telling the story I, you know where, where did you hear this and and i was basically told don't ask oh wow. so uh you know that's one of those things that okay well 
And, and keep in mind, I was very skeptical of the story when I first heard it, but several events happened. And probably the most important thing that happened for me, and I interviewed this gentleman for two hours, and I can tell you he is absolutely telling the truth. Uh, and he's written his own book, is Mr. Martin Groves, uh, Beast Between the Rivers. Shout out uh, to Martin Groves. Yes, Martin Groves. And uh, I talked with him at length, and uh, he... He told me what these creatures look like, which you can see on the front of the Facebook that he did. Him and his deputy partner were surrounded by these creatures in the land between the lakes one evening when they were turkey hunting. Uh, if it had not been for Martin's police training and uh, his partner's police training, they wouldn't have made it out alive. Right. Uh, I've actually heard people, that story, yes. Yes. Uh-huh. And uh, he got a good look at this creature. And uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, I'll show it one more time. This is what these creatures look like. Oh, my God, dude. Uh, they're not, uh, not the most pleasant thing you'd want to see out in the woods. So they seem to be very aggressive, too. They seem to be very aggressive. Yes, in comparison very to, aggressive. say, Sasquatch or other, you know, Sasquatch can be... You might get the you know the occasional bluff charge or they'll pace you out but dog men seem to be extremely aggressive for whatever reason yes and and i believe that they're opportunistic creatures okay. uh if they sense that uh there is an opportunity they may actually prey on uh people uh there mm -hmm. have been several witnesses the bray road Beast is a similar uh, creature that is pretty well documented. Oh, was uh, it again? The beast? Brave Road Beast? I'm Bra sorry. Brave Road, did, did, I'm sorry, Steve. You said the Brave Road Beast? Is that what you yes, said? Yes. Not in this okay. area, but uh, the Brave Road Beast is pretty well documented. Uh, the, these creatures seem to exist. Uh, in in uh, areas that uh, are not just the LBL. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have one story of a creature uh, of an island in Louisiana. Uh, the local Ooh. people talk about this island, uh, which is just uh, near the coast. And uh, the local fishermen will tell anybody that's visiting in that area, don't go to this island at night. Don't go near it uh, for wow. the same creature. And uh, and there's actually been eyewitness that have been run out of this island by a upright walking dog, uh, bipedal dog. Uh, these creatures are des described as being able to achieve speeds of over 45 miles an hour. As a matter of fact, I have it in uh, this is on all fours, not on two. Wow. But they do stand and walk upright. <clears throat> Uh, but they are capable of speeds in the mid 40s. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a story in my book which describes the speed that a witness uh, who was a law enforcement officer uh, caught on his equipment of one of these creatures attacking a white tailed deer, a deer in a field. And it achieved 47 miles an hour, Holy which is God. pretty fast. Uh, you're not going to outrun these creatures. And no. if these creatures decide to prey on you, uh, they don't leave many witnesses. Uh, th these are not the only accounts of people that have been killed by these creatures. Uh, there's another incident that occurred uh, in the LBL of another hunter being killed. I don't have that story in my book, but I'm aware of the story. Why do you uh, think, Steve, why do you think that the, these these dogmen exist in certain places, or do you think that they're in more places? It's just that they're well known to be in the LBL. What is it about the LBL that, I mean, I know there's water it used to be the land between two rivers, as far as I remember. Right. Um, yeah. What is it about they, that place that makes it so, ooh, whatever you want to it call has, it? It has grown up. The land between the lakes is the largest inland peninsula in the United States. It's almost 200 square miles of, of, uh, of land. Since the residents were in there, and uh, coincidentally, uh, my father returned from, uh, retired from the Army in 1960, and we had bought a house in the LBL. This is actually on the Tennessee River side. Uh, okay. And two years later, when they were using eminent domain, uh, everybody 
was required to leave the LBL. So since the 1963, this area has grown up and had very little, uh, if anything, done to it. Uh, mainly, uh, you know, the campgrounds they put in, which a lot of those they have closed down. There are still, you know, a couple of active campgrounds further south, but up north uh, around the Kentucky border, which this uh, entire area encompasses Tennessee and Kentucky, that's how wide it is. You have Barkley Lake on one side and you have the uh, uh, Tennessee River or what used to be the Tennessee River on the other side, which is uh, now known as Kentucky Lake. Uh, they built the dams when my father was coming back from uh, World War II. Uh, and I have the story in my book and everything. He, he was wounded in the hand uh, in the Ardennes Forest of Germany okay. mm -hmm. by a oh. uh, German rifle prote uh, propelled grenade. That's and interesting. I used to be, I'm a, former, I'm a former U.S. Army soldier myself, and I was actually stationed in Germany. So thank you very much for your service. And uh, I appreciate that. But my father was escorting two blind soldiers back that had lost their sight in combat. So uh, he was given 60 days leave. His hand had become infected and he almost lost his hand because he was having to dig in a 30 caliber machine gun because he was in the middle of Ardennes right before the uh, what became known as the uh, Battle of the Bulge, of the Bulge. and the Germans were surrounding the whole area. Okay. Uh, and he actually escorted some uh, uh, some uh, armor uh, commanders and their crews from tanks that uh, had had their tanks blown out from under them. He escorted them back through that area. There's one uh, small area they could get out of that they weren't surrounded. So, father's generation. Your father's generation was a completely different breed of man. Uh, you know? I agree with that. They, yeah. they, it was my grandfather. He was actually stationed over there too during World War II. Yeah. And my uh, father, they were just different. Yeah, they, they, they did what they had to do at the time. My, my father actually made five seaborne invasions, including wow. Omaha Beach, where he received the Silver Star for his oh, wow. action on that. He was the 20th Combat Engineers, and he was one of the first troops on the beach and uh, had to work his way up. And, uh, but uh, the way I relate the story is my father, after he had uh, escorted these blind soldiers, one of them went to Louisiana, one of them was in California back. He was coming back by bus. This area had changed so much when they flooded the Tennessee River that he could even recognize what road to get off of because they had moved residents on, on the outer banks of what was the Tennessee River further right. into the land between the lakes. And he had to ask a girl on the bus, which fortunately knew where his mother lived. And she told him, you get off of this road here. That's how much this area had changed. My father had lived there his entire life and he, could, he didn't even recognize it. Of course, he had been overseas for four years. And, uh, but fortunately someone on this bus he was uh, on recognized said, your mother lives down this road here, which is now called the Fort Henry Road. That's very and, interesting. And this happened, this happened while he was in the war. So like, 43, 41 44. to 45, 44. 44, yeah, 1944, he was wounded, when he returned. Uh, yeah, when he returned uh, and escorted yeah. the blind soldiers back uh, right okay. before the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he was in the Ardennes. Uh, he had seen a lot of combat, and as you know, they moved a lot of the weary troops over to the Ardennes for rest, you know, thinking right. there wasn't going to be an attack there. Well, unfortunately, that was not to play. My, my father was not there during the main attack, but he was there, you know, uh, a month or so before, and they were building up forces, and they literally surrounded, you know, his his place, you know, and knocked out some tanks. So fighting was ongoing even before the main push. And right. uh, he said it was the million-dollar wound he got. You know how that goes. You know, he got wounded in the, uh, in the hand, but it wasn't enough to – get the hand cut off but it was enough to where he had to go back so okay uh, he's talking okay. about that million dollar wound he got shout out to mr 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 causey uh, <laughs> what, uh, uh, what an incredible yeah. man he was he was lucky but uh at any rate this uh the uh 
of course, they they flooded for hydroelectric. Uh, the uh, the uh, Kentucky Lake was formed. Later, Barkley was formed. Uh, in the mid '60s, uh, President uh, Kennedy decided to make this a national recreation area, and that's when the rest of the residents were moved out of the land between the lakes. So it is quite an expansive, uh, literally the largest inland peninsula in the United States. You have Barkley on one side, you have Kentucky on the other. Some of the forest areas in this area. There have been scientists in there have grown to 90, the tree canopy has grown to 90%. Now that may sound like a lot, and it is, because if tree canopy reaches 90%, the uh, underlying plants and stuff have trouble surviving. Right. So it is a very thick uh, foliage in the summer. And uh, there are plenty of cave areas in this area too, and dogmen are known to frequent caves, uh, you know, all over the United States or living okay. these areas. But the story as I heard it goes that after these corners were on site, uh, around 3 a.m., I believe is what I had heard, uh, military troops begin coming in. They don't know where these military troops come from. They could have been from the 101st. Uh, people didn't recognize their insignia or they could have been a special units force that came in. Uh, the federal authorities told all the local policemen that not to talk about what they had seen and they instructed them to close the park and uh, Put, well, the, 101, uh, least, the 101 would have made sense because that's Fort Campbell. That's the Screaming Eagles. That's Air Assault. Yes, that and makes, very that close. That makes sense. Yeah, right, that's very close, very yes. Close. Uh -huh. The uh, 101st is actually, uh, it, uh, their helicopters fly over the LBL all the time. Right, they live right, on right. The Air Assault, they, they repel yeah. from helicopters, yes. Exactly, and I live right on the edge of the LBL. As a matter of fact, I can almost toss uh, a stone and hit Barclay Lake. So they moved, uh, they told these police officers, uh, sheriff's deputies and state police and everything to secure the perimeter of the park, which is what you would do. The story as I heard it was later that morning and the time frame, I do not know exactly. It was just later that morning. Uh, these police officers that were on the outskirts of the park began to hear simultaneous reports of several automatic weapons at some distance. And uh, uh, at some point later, probably about an hour later, some of the agents that were there attending were allowed to go back into the park in hopes of identifying this creature that they had pulled up. But they witnessed uh, about eight soldiers struggling to load about an eight foot, seven and a half, an eight foot hairy creature onto the back of a deuce and a half. For people who aren't familiar with the deuce and a half, uh, which I'm sure you are, uh, yeah, is sure the military. Deuce and a quarter, isn't it? Uh, I've, I've always heard it's deuce and a half. Uh, I've I actually driven know, one. You may know more about that than me. Uh, but you know, deuce military and a half. truck, yeah, <laughs> deuce and a quarter, deuce and a half. There's one of the two. Uh, so it's two and a half tons or two and a quarter ton vehicle. I've driven one before. Ton, yeah. Very vehicle. touchy air brakes. Very touchy air brakes. I've, yes. <laughs> and I actually have a picture of a 1980s uh, deuce and a half uh, in my book. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so this this truck uh, is a has a bed about 12 foot long. And yes. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, it, can, it can have a canopy over it or it can yes. be open with the uh, sides on it. This creature supposedly took up a good portion of this truck. And uh, they... Uh, took a closer look at, at it, had the, the, the a head like a dog about two to three times the size of a normal dog. A uh, very muscular creature. Uh, many of the people on site that entered the camper and also the people that were looking at this uh, creature had to wear scarves over their nose because the stench was so bad that a lot of the emergency personnel and some of the deputies were throwing up on site. That's right. how bad the stench was. And that's very un unusual because uh, uh, I used to be with the rescue squad for many years up in a okay. small county in Tennessee. And I can tell you that <clears throat> the people that attend automobile accidents are well trained. 
they're not used to throwing up, even though some of those wrecks can be pretty horrendous. And yes. uh, the, it was stated that the camper, the inside of the camper smelled this way, and the uh, uh, people that uh, were witnessing this creature, uh, it was almost described as the smell of death. Is what was described as this creature smelling like. Did they supposedly the army what? whisked this thing out of there, and mm -hmm. uh, you know that was the end of that story. You know, mm -hmm. supposedly they got the one that killed this family. The really sad part of this story is they found three of the uh, family close to the camper, but when the deputies entered the camper in the back room, they noticed there were clothes for a little girl, uh, approximately eight to nine years old is what they estimated. So during this period, this was before you know, the army came in and all this happened, they, uh, they started searching because they were uh, hopeful that there was a little girl that was alive, maybe a, wit a witness and maybe she had survived the attack. But they made it only a short distance. I've heard it was about 150 or 200 yards. One of the deputies was walking under a tree and, and felt something gripping on him. He oh looked up, God. and unfortunately, this little girl was lodged in a tree. She had been partially eaten, and blood was dripping from her, from her oh body. Oh, my God. And uh, that's so, uh, unfortunately, there are four victims of this uh, alleged uh, incident that happened. Why do you but, think this is sorry. being covered up, Steve? Why do you think this is being covered up? I mean, like something of that gruesome, so, something this gruesome of details, you would think it would be known there would be some type of movie by now about it, some horror movie about some monster in the woods. What, what, is, the, what is the purpose of covering this up? Well, uh, if you sit and think about it, this is a recreational area. And, uh, you know, the authorities certainly wouldn't want it out that they have some kind of creature which is dangerous, uh, you know, in this area because people wouldn't come to. Yeah, but what now, about the people's lives, Steve? What about people's lives? You know, if you, I mean, you know, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes and don't drink and boat and all this stuff, but there's a literal monster in the woods killing people and they're not going to say anything? That's, that's, I don't know, man. I, I, I believe you, but. Yeah, Mr. Martin Groves was told by park authorities that what he witnessed that night was a mangy bear. Right. So, you know, that gives you a little evidence there that they don't want this out. Now, did this story actually happen? That's why I say alleged. I'm not 100% sure this story happened. However, mm -hmm. all the facts came together to make me make me believe that the story that I heard many years ago was accurate or at least partially true. Uh, I tried to relate in my book exactly as I heard the story because it was such, when you hear a story like this, it's kind of, it's kind of something that sticks in your memory. Uh, yes. It's, it's like I say, I was with the rescue squad, your first rescue where you've got people injured and stuff like that, that sticks in my memory. Like, uh, you know, I remember everything that happened, everything I did. Uh, so I remember, uh, you know, the story because it was quite traumatic. And as I mentioned, I did not initially believe the story, but several factors came together. I think one of the biggest is uh, Martin Groh's testimony. Him and his deputy were attacked by these things. They were surrounded him. It scared his deputy partner so bad he had a stroke and was never able to work again. Uh, I didn't know and, that. Uh, yes. Oh, my Lord, I didn't know that. Work again. Yeah. And if Martin's police training oh had not kicked in, uh, he would have been a victim. And as I mentioned, these creatures, they don't leave many witnesses. And uh, there are people that believe they're out there. There are people that are skeptical that don't believe they're out there. I cannot say I've seen one, but I have talked and interviewed enough credible people where I believe they do exist. Yes. Um, I was going to ask you something. Um, have you been able to speak with any of the any of the people who were involved in this alleged situation, like any coroners or any police officers or military personnel have you been able to get in touch because i know it's been what did you say 40 years ago 30 30 40 it's years a ago? 40 year old code uh, case. so this is not this is in, in the 80s then 
uh, yes. And okay. I'd rather not reveal any sources I have. No, I would, I'm not saying, I would, I, Steve, that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking but is, have I you have ever called been... indirectly. Okay. I'll put it that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good enough. All that's all we need to know. That's all we need to know. Okay, so so there's some validity to the situation. That's great. That's fine. Yes, as a matter of fact, there are several law enforcement officers who have actually come out in the past years and talked about this. There's one gentleman that witnessed a couple being killed on shore. He was in a bank. He's a wildlife officer uh, for Kentucky, and he was wow. he was not on duty. But uh, if you know, you can find this on the blogs and everything if you look hard hard enough. Mm -hmm. But there was one gentleman that uh, was a Kentucky wildlife officer, and he was off duty, but he was in his boat off the shore, and he noticed a couple that was uh, in a tent, uh, a man and a woman. And at the same time, he glanced over and he noticed something stalking them that was crawling on all fours. Oh my and he God. literally tried to warn them and get their attention. He did get their attention, but they could not understand what he was saying. And one of these creatures attacked him and, and killed him, uh, oh killed God. both the couple. Uh, they say he was in kind of a shock. He just drifted on his boat for a while until he came to his senses. Uh, because, uh, and this is a well-known story too. Uh, really? But... As far as proof goes, you're not going to find anybody that admits to this or is going to do it on camera. And once again, do I know this actually happened 100%? No. no but I feel I feel certain enough with the sources I have that it, it did happen. And once again, Martin Groves is a big uh, influence on me because uh, – I know Mr. Martin is telling the truth. I've talked to him in person many times. Uh, the first time I talked to him was two hours. Okay. Uh, talked to him, and you can see it in his face that he's telling the truth. Like, As a I, matter I, of fact, I, I have to agree with you because I, I spoke. Uh, we had I had an interview with Matt Imch a couple months ago, and it was uh, like an hour, hour and a half, and what he described, which you guys can go back and check that one of the older episodes. And the way he described it, he got lucky to get out of her alive too. The only thing that saved him was a train that was coming by and it honked the horn. And this thing had him trapped up in like the third story of this like uh, old steel mill. And it, it's incredible. It's incredible. These people, they don't say certain things because of the positions they're in. Martin Groves being a former state police, police officer, you can't say these kind of things and have some type of career because people are – going to basically kick you out of the position that you're in because they don't want to hear it. They think you lost your mind, but I, I believe them. And um, I, I think the purpose of this show or this, this podcast, however you want to call it, as well as what you're doing is to kind of make people aware that there's things out there that we just don't know about. And you should always be watching your six. You should always be aware, prepared. And I would say, if you're going to go into the woods, uh, be armed, at least be armed. And, and, you know, and, and, and second, I would say, take somebody else with you um, because these things seem to be happening more frequently, be happening more frequently. And uh, it's very um, treacherous out there. I don't, I don't know what, what these things are. Um, I don't know where they come from, but they are out there. And uh, yeah, just, just be careful out there, people. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yes, and I agree with you. That's a big part of it. And uh, I mentioned this in my book. Uh, many of these law enforcement officers and stuff, they have families they're feeding. They, they do what they're told because they have superiors. It's a, uh, and you being ex-military understand that. It's a kind of command that you go through. Uh, if you try to say too much about this event or anything, Martin kept this to himself for years until after he retired because these people, these law enforcement officers have families to feed. They have their own lives. Uh, you know, they have careers. Their careers can easily be uh, extinguished, you know, mm -hmm. if they were to say too much at the wrong time. But yeah. Martin has done a lot of research in this area. He also has a second book, which is called Beasts Between the Rivers, A Trace of Death. 
for right, the interview of, several the L, LBL had the trace road right yeah, right interesting yeah. very very well <laughs> yeah uh, and that's that's exactly what that is it's it's uh it's called the trace of death because the trace is the primary road that goes between Dover, Tennessee, and uh, the upper part in Kentucky near Grand Rivers uh, is called the Trace. Uh, he is he spent thirty years after his encounter, or almost thirty years after his encounter, researching this, uh, talking to witnesses. Which, if you read his second book, his first book tells about his encounter, which is uh, frightening enough. Uh, the second book is interviews he's done with credible witnesses that have witnessed these things and had experiences, encounters with them. Uh, there are several witnesses I, I'll, I'll bring to one point, and I had heard this. I believe it's in Martin's book as well, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, a gentleman was driving through the trace, the land between the lakes, uh, getting off work, uh, uh, and he was driving to Kentucky. And uh, he witnessed uh, one of these creatures walking out in the middle of the road with three little ones behind it, the smaller dog-like creatures. All, all four of them were, were walking on two legs. He turned his high beam zone and got a better look at him. Of course, he stopped. He didn't want to run over any animal and everything. And he said, this female dog man turned around, looked at him. He got a very, very good look at that and the creatures and they were making uh, dog like noises, you know, whimpers like a like a, a puppy will only much deeper, you know, because wow. they're bigger animals. So there is evidence there is a breeding population of these creatures in the land between the lakes. And uh, there's another witness and i believe this is in martin's book also that talks about going through the land between the lakes dark at uh it was very dark and she was driving by the buffalo pen which they have a place down there with buffalo which you can go and see them much as they are in their native uh uh you know as they've been mm -hmm. in the uh late 1800s uh they had okay. A uh, wide field for them with feeding, you know, kind of like cattle would be, you know, they're they're a little bit more tame than wild buffalo, but uh, because they're well fed, but still you wouldn't want to go up and approach one, you know, but you can see them kind of in a natural habitat. This this witness had been going through the land between the lakes once again late at night and noticed all these buffalo, the uh, parents and uh, everything were in a circle a closed circle and all the younger buffalo were inside that circle and she thought that's strange i've never seen these buffalo circles so she pulled off side road and looked at them and then she happened to notice after she got to looking closer that there were two or three creatures outside of this trying to gain entry into this circle and she described them as dog looking creatures you know that were on two feet they had the heads of dogs and they were trying to figure out a way to get into the little buffalo. And, and as you know, a buffalo is, is a healthy creature, you know, uh, weighs 1,500, 1,800, 2,000 pounds, uh, which is, is a massive creature. They were protecting their young from these creatures. And she had actually yelled at them or honked her horn to try to get them uh, away from that. And then their attention was diverted to her. Mm -hmm. And supposedly they started running mm -hmm. toward her and she got in her car and got out of there. Okay. So That's yeah, there, there are do, multiple witnesses. Do, do you think there's been an increase, an, 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 an increase, excuse me, uh, an increase of, uh, of, of sightings of these things in the last couple of years, or is it that more people are stepping forward because of the internet? I think more people are stepping forward, although there are accounts of these creatures ongoing uh, on up uh, the last year or two uh, witnesses. Uh, and uh, these are credible witnesses. Uh, so the, the creatures are out there, I believe. Uh, I have been in the LBL, uh, you know, uh, over the past year, uh, uh, I have not seen one, but I've been in the areas where they supposedly are. Uh -huh. However, 
I believe these creatures are primarily nocturnal creatures. Uh, I don't like going in there myself at night unless, no, as you mentioned, I'm well armed or something. Um, I went, uh, I actually had a trip here not too long ago where I, uh, February is coyote season. It's open season on the coyote. So me and a friend went down there, but you can only hunt in the daytime. You're not allowed to hunt in, at night uh, in the LVL. And uh, I went to some areas which uh, are known to have these creatures, but uh, my friend who is ex-military, you know, was carrying 5.56. Five, I was carrying a 6.5 Grendel myself uh, on an AR-15 platform. Uh, so I don't like going in. You mentioned something earlier about going in there. I don't like going in there unarmed, but I had a legitimate no. purpose, all the licenses I needed, uh, and we were hunting coyote. Uh, but I would be somewhat hesitant, particularly at night, to go in certain areas of the LBL because uh, there are certain areas that they literally have locked off. Wow. Wow, because I was talking to Daryl Denton, and he goes up there a lot. He, he's also friends with Martin Groves and Barton Nunley, and they go up there and they, you know, they, they, you know, I guess you would say, you know, try to find out what's going on with these animals. And he was telling me, when you cross the border into that area, into the LBL, he said there's something very unique about how it feels. There's, he can't describe it. He's been to uh, other places and other farms where there was like, you know, Sasquatch activity, where he's seen glowing lights that turn into possums and all kind of crazy stuff. But he said the LBL is a very unique place for some reason. Can you attest to anything to that? Do you have any type when you go and cross the border from whether side you're coming from? Do yes. you feel something, too? Yes, that is very true. And and by the way, I know Barton Nunley and Daryl uh, Denton. They're both good friends of mine. Uh, I'm oh, wow, okay. One of Shout the out to Daryl. Very yes. legitimate witnesses. Yes, Very they are. legitimate researchers. They only want the truth. Uh, there's no uh, second agenda with them. They're, they're searching for the truth just like the rest of us are. And yes, I can attest to that. I, uh, me and my friend went to the massacre site several months ago. Uh, the feeling I get when I'm there is just eerie. It's almost like uh, uh, there's there's you don't see any wildlife in the area, which is really strange. Wow. Uh, you know, it's almost like there's something in there that's... Uh, uh, you know, disrupting. It's just a, I can't describe the feeling. I'm not psychic or anything. I never have mm -hmm. been that much, but every once in a while I have feelings. And uh, this feeling just gave me the creeps being down in there. And we were mm -hmm. in there, you know, looking around. There's also supposedly uh, one of the family members that was massacred in the site uh, people have seen a lady in dress late okay. at night. They're lo looking for her child. Oh my God. So that's, that's been several of the reports that come out of here. So yeah, there's an eerie, creepy feeling that, uh, I get, I know there are a lot of, one of the better or, uh, group of people that go in there is a organization called the Hellbent Holler. It's a wife. Okay. Uh, I've heard of them. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have a couple of photos uh, in my book. One of the photos that they captured here a couple of years ago is a thermal image. And they called it down in this area where the massacre site is. And if you look closely uh, near what uh, it's thermal and they use black equals heat. And now what that means is anything that is heated is gonna give off a black image. Okay, the reason so like they do that, yeah. The reason they do that is, uh, and they explained it uh, here not too long ago, is because if they do the thermals, the thermals where you use like red as heat uh, tend to blossom, and I can understand that the thermal image is not clear. But in my book, the LBL massacre, I actually have an image that they took that shows pretty clearly a dog-like creature leaning up against. What, I, uh, what is an uprooted tree or near a tree, and you can see the ears on it, you can see the arms, long arms hanging down. Uh, and to me, that's pretty pretty impressive truth. And, and they caught this uh, 
here a couple of years ago. They were initially skeptical of the story too when they heard it, but they went in and did some research and now they firmly believe that this wow. creature exists. And one of these things that uh, they base that on is the image they captured, which as I mentioned is available in Martin's Excellent. first book and also mm. in my book, The LBO Massacre. Incredible. Do, uh, do you have any future ideas or projects you're going to be working on? I'm probably going to work on a sequel to this book. Uh, I have not, I'm gathering, still gathering evidence. I want to do more research. I want to get more information. Uh, it's uh, that is the most lengthy part of this process is getting this information together. I hope gotcha. to have another one, maybe not uh, this year, but I'm hoping maybe the early spring of 2025. Uh, what I'm trying to do is gather as much information as I can. Every story I hear, which I hear legitimate stories all the time, uh, one of the stories that will be in my new book, I'll go ahead and tell it is I talked to a trapper that uh, okay. was down at a local marina right here who, who has been a trapper his entire life. I mean, since he was nine years old, his father trapped, uh, you know, he taught him how to trap. And he was actually catching uh, and uh, getting rid of uh, raccoons in the marina area when I talked to him. And uh, I was walking by and he, he, by the way, uh, and I didn't know who he was. And I said, uh, you know, uh, I was walking by him. He said, I've read your book. And wow. I turned around kind of surprised, you know, and I said, <laughs> really, you, you read my book? And he said, yeah, the LBL massacre. And then he told me what happened to him uh, in the land between the lakes, which is uh, on the Barkley side of it and everything. He was in there squirrel hunting. And uh, it was kind of a, a dreary day. And he came across some footprints that he could not identify. Uh, he's, he's, keep in mind, this is a gentleman who is an experienced trapper. Right. And uh, he, he saw some footprint that were the largest dog tracks he'd ever seen in his life that had claws that extended out in front of it. He said, there is no dog around here that can make that kind of track. Uh, he said they were six inches across. And uh, so he, he looked at these tracks and uh, unfortunately the LBL in many places, uh, it is so thick, your cell phones don't work there real well. So okay. he came, he was going to come back and get uh, pictures of this. He didn't have his phone with him. And unfortunately it rained real hard uh, and uh, he had lost his, uh, or he had uh, went back and, he had lost his opportunity to get these uh, tracks because they were kind of washed out and they weren't nearly as plain as what he'd seen. But he said these were fairly fresh tracks. And he said whatever left these tracks had to avoid at least 400 pounds. And it, this is a trapper. You know, this is a man that knows what, uh, you know, what bears look like. Yep. He knows what, tra uh, you know, what leaves tracks. He said, these tracks were not of anything I have ever seen. Wow. And when he told me that, I said, do you mind if I include that in my uh, next book? And he, he, of course, gave me permission, gave me permission to do that. Incredible. So, Steve, thanks so much for coming. I really, I really appreciate it. You've, you've given me a lot, a lot of food for thought. Is there any, like, is there anything that you would want to tell somebody who's thinking about going out and searching for these things because maybe maybe they shouldn't or maybe they should or is there anything any cautionary uh, things you would say or uh, is there any like advice that you would give to people looking for these creatures well i will say this much there is uh you know more than likely you're not going to run into one of these creatures uh i meant that they, they tend to uh if they want you to see them, they're kind of like Bigfoot, which we have DNA evidence of Bigfoot. Uh, we know that he exists. Uh, but these creatures, uh, and, and that's also included in my uh, book, and that's uh, I have references to that. Uh, there's actually several uh, uh, accounts of uh, a Bigfoot DNA uh, that is 99% human and one eight marker. Uh, so we know he exists. Uh, 
these creatures, I think, exist, uh, to be honest with you. I think it's very rare you're going to see them. They're only going to make themselves known. They're going to, if you sit and consider a creature that has the senses of a wolf, uh, he's going to know that you're around much sooner than you know. Than you around. will, yes. <laughs> a wolf has 100 times the sense of smell that a human does. And that's also in my book. Uh, literally, he's going to know you're around long before you know he's around. If you go camping in these areas that are real remote at night, I suggest that you take, you just understand there may be other creatures out there and, and uh, you may not be the apex predator, even if you have a gun in these areas. So All right. that is, uh, you know, that is my advice. Just always, as you mentioned, watch your six o'clock. Be aware that there might be something out there that that you don't science doesn't recognize. That's true. But hopefully, one day it'll come around to doing it. But you also know that science, if actually done correctly, would actually maybe recognize some of these animals. But we all know at the end, it's some type of. Uh, well, it's my career. I've written these books, and I'm at this university, and I have tenure. So therefore, I'm not going to shake the boat. Kind of the same thing that we were talking about with these, you know. State troopers, Daryl Ben used to be a public official and he couldn't come out with his experiences. And uh, so that's kind of the same thing that's happened with science. But if it was actually used the way it's supposed to be, I think a lot of these uh, animals would already be, you know, like recognized. So who knows? <laughs> I believe so. I, I'm hoping that what they will do, and it's fairly new technology, is you'll get some people in there that will have eDNA test kits, environmental DNA test kits. You can take samples of streams and stuff. If more interest comes to this area and hopefully scientific interest, maybe we can get some DNA samples from these creatures, you know, oh, no. through streams and footprints. Yeah, well, uh, we'll, 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 I guess we'll cross our fingers and see if that ever happens. <laughs> but exactly. anyway, Steve, yeah. Yeah. once again, thanks for coming on the Eye of Jupiter. Could you once again please promote your book and tell us where maybe we can find you? Yes, sir. Uh, my book is available on Amazon. It's called The LBL Massacre. And uh, it's uh, you can go on LBL and you can either get the uh, printed area, uh, the printed version or you can get the electronic version downloaded instantly. And uh, uh, I do plan on a sequel to this. Uh, like I say, it'll be in the future. I will have more stories and more evidence. And uh Martin Groh's book, Beast Between the Rivers, is also available on, uh, on Amazon, and you can uh, get his book. As a matter of fact, I recommend his book in the uh, back of my book because I've, I've talked to Martin at length. So I certainly do appreciate you having me on the show. I appreciate you coming on, man. I really appreciate it. And um, when if the podcast still exists by then, which I hope it will, and we'll have you back on. We'll, we'll promote your next book as well, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, just hold on one second. I'll be right back with you, okay? Okay. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that was Mr. Steve Causey. Go out and do me a favor and go out and buy his book and promote um, his things that he's doing because I think a lot of this, um, this dogman stuff is going to start to affect more and more people, and we need to have people prepared. Um, so if you're going to go out in the woods, you're going to go hunting, you're going to go fishing trip with your family, you should definitely – take some type of protection with you because you know, you never know what's out there. And uh, thanks once again for watching the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And um, remember, we are the eye and we are aware. Thank you so much for watching. You have been listening to the eye of Jupiter podcast. If you have any strange occurrences, stories, or witness anything out of the ordinary, don't be afraid to send me an email at the I of Jupiter podcast at gmail.com and maybe you will be on the show. And please remember, we are the I and we are aware. <laughs>